Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mutual Knowledge Podcast. I am Gautier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Anton Golub. Hi, Anton. Hi, Gautier. Thank so, you very much for welcoming me, and it's a blast to be here. So, Anton, you are a serial entrepreneur. You are a four times founder. You are active in the cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and Web3 business since 2013. And at the moment, you are a founder, the founder and president of Swiss Asset DAO, and also involved in many many other cool projects so um let's start with the most interesting thing i saw from you um i saw a linkedin post that you did about the fact that every everyone's got it all wrong about asset tokenization and after reading that i was like hey come on shit maybe I, i'm also wrong about it so i'd love to talk about that today <laughs> with you can you first of all introduce yourself your background and how you came in contact with this lovely industry, the blockchain world. Awesome. I'm happy to do that. So uh, originally my background is from traditional finance. So I worked at a very big hedge fund in Switzerland as a high frequency trader. So really great experience, you know, this intersection of finance, technology, trading markets, really enjoyed it. Uh, had a great time doing that. Uh, but I would like to say then that I was at the right place at the right time. I co-founded back in 2013, uh, the second ever crypto company in Switzerland called Lika, uh, that I was co-leading for almost five years, uh, which was also an amazing experience. You know, uh, we scaled the company, you know, from two to 200 people, offices over the world, you know, one of the oldest and biggest exchanges in Europe, something really, really amazing, you know, for me, and I really liked it. And also really where it was my first hands-on experience where I saw the opportunities of the blockchain, in sense of you know being a settlement layer being a platform where you can digitize assets create tokens create coins and people can swap them and trade them in an efficient way comparing to how we used to do it in traditional finance where settlement would last for several days there was a lot of costs a lot of intermediaries a lot of fees kind of at the blockchain we could do that all in an integrated way very efficiently very fast and very cheap so really great experience with Lika. I did an exit early 2018 and then launched a market making company. And usually people ask me why a market maker after a crypto exchange It's because there's something magical that happens the first day when you launch a crypto exchange, you learn that without liquidity, you cannot scale, you cannot grow. There's no liquidity on the order books. Nobody can trade. And I kind of really saw this challenge hands on, you know, at my own crypto exchange, but also all the other ones I had friends who ran big crypto exchanges, I would always ask them, how is liquidity on your crypto exchange? They would all tell me it's horrible. It's a disaster. Can you bring someone? <laughs> if you have someone, just let me know. Obviously, it was a lot different than today where you have a handful of crypto market makers, professional trading firms. But back then, it was like a very, you know, very nascent idea, nascent concept, you know. So I was leading Fluff Technologies, Fluff Tech, for almost five years as CEO. So we were market making all of your top tier exchanges that I'm sure the audience and you would know of. And likewise, you're market making for a lot of projects. So projects who issue their own token and they need a market maker to make the token liquid on all the crypto exchanges we're listed. And market making some, for some really huge famous projects that I'm sure you would know of, but a lot of early stage ones. So kind of all shapes and sizes, yeah. Uh, I did an exit in mid of 2022 and then I launched with a, uh, my co-founder, Mike, an initiative called Swiss Asset DAO with the vision to bring real real world asset investment opportunities to the crypto native companies and the reason for that is because you know as i was already back then a part of the crypto industry for almost 10 years we're always talking and dreaming about tokenization and bringing everything of value in form of a token on the blockchain and this concept of real world assets like this terminology real world assets appeared you know some two three years ago and we were really passionate about it and thought we, we could make it work and over the last, you know, two years, I really learned, we learned inside out how tokenization works and doesn't work, by the way, right? It doesn't work so as people imagine it. Okay. And it's been amazing and great experience, you know, but also understanding as well, there's a long way ahead of us for the tokenization of old asset industry. Okay, so let's talk about um, asset tokenization because I, we see that everywhere. We see that uh, for 
real estate. We see that for um, uh, regarding NFTs associated with physical products. We see that with uh, shipment tracking with many things. And uh, we even see that for um, legacy heritage, for family heirlooms uh, that, uh, that are transmitted from one generation to another. So this tech is everywhere. And um, first of all, Let's dive in the in the, the subject from the classical stance. What is the way people think about it? How do most people think about when they talk about um, uh, asset tokenization? And could you please tell us then why you think this is not the way we should look at it? Yes. Yeah. So first, just to say, is a very strong belief conviction on my side that tokenization is going to be one of the biggest opportunities in the crypto industry. Mm -hmm. And literally everything of value will be on the blockchain in tokenized form <laughs> at some point into the future. So just really make make that very strong statement. Some estimates, I don't know if you want to believe them or not, are literally saying trillions and trillions, tens of trillions of dollars in tokenized form in 10 years or less. But now we then have to reflect, okay, where are we now on that road to trillions? Now, if you take a closer look, you will realize that the total market cap or valuation, or however you want to call it, of tokenized real world assets is barely a few billion. Okay. So today you have meme coins and you have projects with maybe not a lot of substance who have a higher market capitalization or more liquidity than the whole real world asset ecosystem. And then the question is like, what's, what are we doing wrong there? Like, why is it not already in trillions or maybe in the tens of billions or hundreds of billions. What's what's going on there? Because everybody seems saying like it's a bigger opportunity. But now I just said kind of like we are barely at the beginning, but everybody's talking about it for 10 years. And I think the biggest misconception that people have is how tokenization of reward does actually happens. Because people kind of imagine they kind of close their eyes and they dream about tokenization of reward assets and they imagine you create a token on the blockchain and somehow it directly represents that asset in the real world. For instance, you mentioned real estate. So if you have a building or, or a real estate portfolio, somehow people imagine you create a token on the blockchain, it directly represents this real estate and everything is fine. That, that's na the, the naive vision, yes. This is the, this. Is, I think it's a dream. It's a good dream, but it's not a reality. And now this is the part where I will shock your, the audience because I usually want to explain how tokenization real world assets works today. And I'll explain it in two sentences, so very quickly. The way it works today is that first, the issuer of the real world assets has to set up something called a special purpose vehicle. And in plain language, this is just a fund. So it's a shell company hmm. somewhere in a tax friendly offshore jurisdiction. And then this special purpose vehicle has to buy and hold and manage the cash flows and everything around the real world asset. And then what happens is we tokenize the share unit in that special purpose vehicle. And that is the stuff that ends up on the blockchain. So imagine what I just described. There is this weird thing in the offshore tax friendly jurisdiction for some weird reason buying the asset. And then you this vehicle somehow manages that asset. And then for some reason we tokenize that share unit means just the shares. It's a shell company. So you tokenize the shares of the shell company because it's shell a company because it just holds the asset, nothing else. And then we put that tokenized share unit, we put it on the blockchain and call it tokenized real world assets. Now, for everybody who just listened to this uh -huh. two minutes or one minute, I was saying, would say, Anton, isn't this the most complex thing I have heard in my life? Why wouldn't you just take an asset and then somehow tokenize it directly on the blockchain? And the answer is actually very simple, is that direct tokenization and recording of, of assets on the blockchain is not allowed from a legal and regulatory perspective in most of the world. So today, if you start a company, you're not allowed in most of the jurisdictions of the planet to directly issue shares on the blockchain. So that the token that represents the shares of the blockchain is the only true sense of that company. And it gives you legal representation, legal right. That's not the case. So that's why we do this garbage with the special purpose vehicles, you know, and all this managing and complexity and everything and i want to explain this complexity that i just described it also comes with fees comes with uncertainty 
comes with all of these challenges, but this is actually how we do it through the organization of special purpose vehicles. And that's why it's been very struggling, you know, very challenging is because you're creating a bad product that has a lot of fees, a lot of co complexity, a lot of legal uncertainty. And then maybe I will try to wrap it up. So I just explained the product that is a garbage product. So who would ever buy this garbage product? Would an institutional investor ever buy that? No, institutional investor will never buy that. Institutional investor can go to Goldman Sachs, say, I have a securities account with you. Please buy directly the real world asset. Please buy directly the US government bond. Please buy directly the private equity portfolio, the real estate portfolio. They don't need to do this game with a special purpose vehicle and then to get a token, which they don't know what to do with it. They can do that directly. So no institutional investor would ever buy such tokens and that's why they're not buying them. So that's why no institutional investor is investing into such tokenized, tokenized real world assets because it's a garbage product, highly complex, with legal uncertainty, and they can do it directly through their prime broker or investment bank. So who is buying tokenized real world assets? The biggest investors today, or the biggest investor today in tokenized real world assets is actually a DeFi protocol called MakerDAO. Mm -hmm. So MakerDAO invested some 2.5 billion into tokenized US government bonds because they cannot go to Goldman Sachs and say, give me an account with you and I will buy government bonds. They cannot do that. So that's why that we play this game with, you know, wrapping the, the special purpose vehicle, we put it on the blockchain and then MakerDAO buys it and deploys capital and it flows to buy the US government bonds and all these gimmicks, you know? And that explains you why the total liquidity of tokenized world assets is so low, because the only target client segment is a specific group of crypto native projects who cannot otherwise buy such real world assets. That's your, five minute explanation what's happening what's wrong and where we are so that's lovely but here i i just have what i want to say is rest in peace decentralization because from what i hear the regulatory framework and uh so the legal framework and the cooperation between states and even some of the technical framework actually aren't really fit for what has been promised exactly Exactly. And I think really you, you make mention here a key point is because you're when you when you a real world asset in many cases it's like a financial security. It's a bond, it's a private equity portfolio, real estate portfolio. Sometimes it's not, but it's most cases it is. And then the question is like how do you deal with these financial securities? And then it turns out just there's not a relevant law to enable you to do this all in a blockchain in an efficient, direct, you know, a, 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 a way with low cost and so on. And Look, very few jurisdictions on the planet allow to do that. I can mention two, so people cannot kind of also know, okay, there are some that allow that. For instance, mm -hmm. one is Switzerland, one is Liechtenstein. But I want to emphasize here one point. To enable direct on-chain issuance and tokenization of real-world assets, Switzerland and Liechtenstein had to change laws. So law, new laws had to go through parliament. Imagine politicians had to discuss it agree on it and after then one and a half two years they have to approve it and then it a year later it goes into an effect so this is a crazy long process so once again switzerland proves that they uh, they are living in the 22nd century uh but uh, how's hopeful how hopeful is the situation for other countries like for example the us or canada or uh, some other uh, european union, union countries uh, do you, have you heard have you got wind of anything regarding these laws or are we stuck in, in, in knee deep and in, uh, in a very mushy substance yeah so there are some changes that will happen now in europe in particularly with regards to the so-called mika Yes, which is a new legislation, uh, uh, you know, that will come into effect in the coming years that kind of allows you a bit more how you can do tokenization directly on chain and kind of issue these assets and, you know, uh, directly on the blockchain. In US, in, in Canada, you can just forget about it. The regulatory framework there is very hostile openly towards crypto company. Every crypto startup in US relevant one has been sued by the regulator. So it's not like a very fertile ground to have discussions around, you know, Let's now enable people to do direct on-chain issues. Even though I want to point out that, that BlackRock has made a lot of moves and a lot of progress in the space of uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs, but also they're doing some pilot projects in the space of token as real assets, but they do the same thing that I just described. 
is the same SPV, tokenized SPV. So it's the same thing and it's not like, but it's good to have such big player in the US trying to do something. And look, the situation is very clear. In the Middle East, there is no regular framework for it. In Asia, in very, very few uh, places, something like that is possible. And not to, and so it's very few places is difficult to do it, but also just want to point out that in many cases, tokenized real assets are actually financial securities. So selling it to retail is extremely difficult. So also want to point out is that because I described challenges from a structuring perspective, you know, these SPVs, mm -hmm. but also you have to think about, okay, how do we sell it to people? And then because it's financial securities, in many cases to retail, it's so difficult to sell that it's, you know, which you would kind of think, okay, maybe they have the most appetite for products that usually they cannot access, but then it's so difficult to sell such products to retail that it's insane. So that's very interesting. And uh, let's imagine for a minute that uh, that the regulatory framework evolves in the right direction to have proper uh, asset tokenization. Okay, from, from what I hear at the moment, the problem is that it's not smooth at all and it costs more than what it brings because of many um, absurdities in, uh, in the legal framework and the technical framework. But um, let's imagine we go there. Um, what are the use cases you deem the most important in the, this ecosystem? Um, what do you think is going to, to take over in terms of asset tokenization? Is it going to be in the B2B world between companies or in the B2C world for uh, everyday life products? Um, is there going to be a, a limit? Where, where do these trillions of dollars that you're, you've been talking about, where do these uh, um, dollars go? Yeah, so... In the, uh, the answer there is actually twofold. So first of all, I don't think that for uh, investors who have access to traditional finance products, they don't need then tokens on the blockchain to represent the same traditional finance products they can access either way to Revolut or to Goldman Sachs or to whoever. Mm. So for there, I think like the, the dream would be actually to tokenize what you would natively think as an illiquid mm. asset but then have a secondary market with liquidity for that reward asset. So for instance, wouldn't it be awesome to tokenize a real estate portfolio, but then have it traded also in a decentralized exchange, obviously that would be a regulated one, or a decentralized automated market maker that also gives you liquidity to get in and out of that token in a fairly efficient way, right? Because today, when you invest into a real estate uh, uh, portfolio, you're locked in for a couple of years, right? So wouldn't it be great to have market makers or market making there that also gives you some liquidity so people can get in and out of that position? So I think for the developed countries or developed markets, it's more about taking something illiquid, tokenizing it, put it on the secondary market, but the key is to have liquidity on that secondary market. Otherwise it will fail. You need to, that's my learning from as a, when I ran a crypto exchange and ran a market making company, you need to have a market maker for the asset to make it liquid. Now, I think for the developed world, you know, they don't have access to standard products that you and I might have. So for instance, they cannot access easily US, the biggest market in the world, which would be the US stock market. They cannot not access the bond markets, but also, they have a problem that you, they are usually dealing with a local domestic currency, which is highly volatile or highly depreciated. So to give them a way out of that, actually, in something less volatile than Bitcoin, for instance, I think that would be also an interesting opportunity. Or to actually get access to stable coins and then deploy that stable coins is something that gives them like a fairly decent return, you know, a mm. decent yield. So I think these are like the two challenges for the, for the developed markets. It's, it's all about uh, liquidity. Can we create enable, enable liquidity for illiquid markets? For developed world, it should be about access to stable uh, products from biggest financial markets in the world. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, allow me to ask what are uh, the most promising companies in your opinion? I, I assume you, you must have you know, a few projects in, in mind that, uh, that you think are contributing to making the uh, this uh, this vision a bit easier to uh, you know to, to become real, uh, well a bit more tangible in the real world yes yeah so i i think uh, first of all there's a, even though i was a bit more um, realistic and harsh about the 
real world asset industry, I want to say there's a, many amazing companies doing amazing work. And to name a few, obviously MakerDAO is the key stakeholder who is deploying capital, but also Ondo, fi Ondo Finance, Open Finance, Maple, Clearloop, Goldfinch, you know, many of them are kind of what they're doing in this borrowing and lending space and offering interesting products. In Switzerland, I would mention two products. One is called Accionariat, which basically enables you to tokenize shares of your company directly on the blockchain because the Swiss law allows that. And then they also create a Uniswap style automated market maker such that your shareholders can trade in and out of their position on their website through a widget which I think is a very interesting use case. And for instance, Obligate, which is in Switzerland, directly issuing debt on chain so people can raise capital. So this is all done directly on chain and up with the SPVs in, in, with these two companies. Um, um, so this would be like a very interesting companies, but look, the biggest success stories of real world assets, if you want to call them like that, actually companies that issue stable coins, even though it gives you no yield, nothing. But Fetter and Circle are the biggest success stories of real world assets, but they're not assets because they don't give you a yield. Even though in the back, they take the capital and they invest into assets and then get the yield. That's how they make money actually, but they don't pass it to, through to you as a stable coin holder. But look, it's the stable coins that are actually the biggest success story to make a transition you know, like that. Yeah, especially because there are so many non G20 economies that are really facing a banking nightmare an inflation nightmare yes. and a bureaucratic nightmare so when you remove all of that with stable coins uh that's very helpful for many many honest and promising businesses all around the world um, and allow me to ask a question in this regard because obviously we are going in this direction um, it's quite consensual. Most of the experts I interview in my podcast are basically telling me, okay, blockchain is going to become the mainstream financial tech. It's going to replace the SWIFT network. All of that, I do agree with that, be, uh, being also in this industry. But uh, how do you think the blockchain will evolve? Because if this industry becomes the main industry, if basically the, this uh, fintech becomes the standard, the gold standard, uh, no pun intended, uh, in the world of finance and replaces also SWIFT for payments, for example. Uh, that means centralization is going to be, uh, the decentralization aspect is going to be problematic for many countries. Uh, there are many countries that will not really be happy to not be able to seize assets. That's why many CBDCs are some kind, uh, a CBDC is some kind of stable coin, but it tastes like a blockchain, it smells like a blockchain, but it's not really a blockchain. So do you think they will use the regular blockchain with many limitations regarding KYC, regarding the, the custody of the funds, for example? Or do you think that the blockchain tech itself will, will evolve and a genuinely hard to, um, to seize asset like Bitcoin will be something from the past if all the tokenized assets in, uh, in the common world be become linked to the blockchain yeah so look i think that over time as we kind of talked about tokenization everything of value will be on the blockchain and it will be on a public blockchain the same way i think you know you and i are maybe a bit older so we remember when the internet started you had a lot of ethernets you know so with the e started with the e not with the i indeed and ethernet was actually the local version of an internet that you would use within a company or whatever and this is complete garbage today nobody does it we all have used open public networks so we have security in place, we have assurances in place, we have cloud infrastructure, and it's all on a public, you know, uh, data transmitting infrastructure. So I think the same will happen with the blockchain. You'll all be on a public blockchain. No? And I think actually, and this has been proven for, I think, for a, a 10 years, more than 10 years. Actually, the crypto industry evolves so much faster than anything that the legacy players can do. Ah. So legacy players are just catching up so much, you know, once they figure out what is a token, you know, the crypto industry already has whole DeFi and AMMs, lending and borrowing pools, you know, a lot tokenization plus, you know, I think it, you know, I think the crypto industry is just way ahead of it. I think where there's the risk for the traditional player is that basically that the DeFi world or decentralized finance or the blockchain can decompose what a lot of traditional legacy players can do. So for instance, a bank can be just decomposed actually to what it does actually in modular pieces 
that you can access all, all on the blockchain. So a bank would be just a collection of DeFi apps over a long period of time. Mm. But you make a very good point, you know, in the end, you know, uh, the, the big lever that the legacy finance has is actually, you know, stable assets, stable coins or CBDCs. Um, and I think CBDCs will be the, actually the biggest threat to the crypto industry because they offer a good alternative to alternative, if you want to call it like that, to the tarnished reputation and image of the stablecoin issuers. So I, I don't think I'm saying anything scandalous when I say that Tether doesn't have the pristine track record circle as well. Yes. From kind of what happened in the last couple of years. And I think, you know, when I talk to a lot of professional institution investors, in addition to the complexities of how tokenization works, they also tell me, Anton, I don't want to hold stable coins. It's just a no go. It's a counterparty risk they cannot handle or don't want to take. And for them, the alternative is actually CBDC because the banks will not issue their stable coin. So just to make that statement very clear to a lot of people, JP Morgan will not issue their own stable coin because that would compete with the CBDC. Of course. And that's why the Fed, the Fed was created such that you don't have private money between the banks, but you have one money, one dollar. And now for CBDC it could be issued, but then you have a JP Morgan dollar, Goldman Sachs dollar, this dollar, it would just actually ruin the whole point of what uh, the Fed is trying to achieve. So if I go a bit further, that means that just like the face of the of the internet we had in the 90s and the early 2000s has changed radically. I mean, uh, a Google search now is very different from what happened in the, the early 2000s. Uh, and the regulatory framework is now also very different. Just like this has changed, the face of the blockchain could change and also evolve towards uh, many new pieces of tech that that have little to nothing in common with the current blockchains in terms of privacy, for example, or um, um, custody of the funds and so on. Yes, that I'm makes so sense. <laughs> that makes sense, and will uh, the future will tell us where this goes. But I agree with the fact that usually the lawmakers are always lagging a bit behind. Um, it's very rare to see them thinking in advance so that's also quite that, that's a regular trend that we can bet on at the same time um thank you so much i had a great time and i'm super happy to hear this original point of view because i was enlightened uh, enlightened and uh, i thank you a lot for that do you have any last word to end this lovely episode yeah so thank you very much for welcoming me i had a blast and giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts even though it was a bit realistic which is more on the not so optimistic side at the moment, but I want to be very positive, you know, to wrap it up. The organization is a massive opportunity and we should all be a part of it in one way or the other. Thank you so much, Anton. Everyone, this was Anton Goldhub. Look him up on LinkedIn. He's a multiple serial entrepreneur, multiple founder and a multiple advisor for many, many different cool companies. And as you can hear, he's got a huge expertise. Follow him, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Discord, whatever. And see you for the next episode. Cheers, Anton.